Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. Do you want to join the international NARM community in support of trauma-informed care? If so, please consider joining us for the online NARM basics training to become a NARM-informed professional. This is the level one training in the Neuroaffective Relational Model for helping professionals work with complex trauma. This professional training is designed to support those of you working with clients or populations dealing with the effects of adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma. This training is for helping professionals in a variety of fields, such as mental health professionals, substance abuse counselors, educators, doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, coaches, and more. In this online training, participants will learn more about the changing field of trauma, a deeper understanding of the impacts of ACEs and complex trauma, and how NARM, one of the first models specifically designed to address complex trauma, can support professionals in the growing trauma-informed field. The next online NARM Basics training is starting in September 2022 and will run one weekend a month through December 2022. 60 continuing education units will be available for most helping professionals. Register now to reserve your spot. We hope you will join us in learning how to transform trauma. For more information and to apply to the online NARM Basics training, please visit narmtraining.com forward slash online basics. And now for our interview. Crystal Lampett worked for years as a TV host and reporter. She has now taken her interest for humanity into her work as a licensed trauma therapist. Born in Cairo, Egypt, to an American father and an Indonesian mother, Crystal has lived across the globe and has a unique understanding of the challenges that come with multi-ethnic identities, life transitions, and highly visible careers. Crystal takes a collaborative and multifaceted approach as she works with her clients. And in this interview, she and I talk about how understanding complex trauma has shaped not only the way she works with clients, but also how she relates to herself and is now able to show up in her own life. Please enjoy this conversation with Crystal Lampett. I'm sitting here with Crystal Lampett. Welcome to the podcast, Crystal. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I listen to this podcast all the time, so it's really nice to be here. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. And as you might know, we typically start these conversations with the question of, what would you like listeners to get out of our conversation today? Yeah, I love that question. And I try to keep it in mind <laughs> before I start every session with clients. I really hope to provide some hope and some validation of just the complexity that comes with being a human, especially for those who are struggling with any sort of questions around identity, around self-worth. And I work specifically with the AAPI community a lot as an Indonesian American woman myself. But whether it's, you know, a cultural, ethnic identity, gender, sexual orientation, I just would love to provide some validation of the value and the importance of every human, regardless of some of those bigger identity questions. Mm, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. So I wondered if we could dive right into mm -hmm. what your work is that you're doing, because you have a really rich background in other fields. And so I'm curious to hear what brought you to the work that you're doing now? And you can give us whatever background you'd like. Yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Okay, yeah. You're right. It was not a linear journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for, like, you know, as it is for so many of us. I got my start in film and media. So I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker. I really loved telling women's stories. And I did work in television. I was on the news. I was a videographer, an editor, a producer for a decade. Mm. So I'm now a therapist, but it took a lot of things happening to get there. So right out of college, my undergraduate years, I literally the day after I graduated, I was on a plane to South Africa. I wanted to get mm. out. I was running away from problems and I had this great opportunity or what I thought was a great opportunity to model and to live in other countries. And so I grew up living all over the world, was born in Egypt. And I think before high school, I had lived in something like five or six different countries and gone to so many different schools that I was like, I'm out, you know, um, I now mm -hmm. live in Kansas. And that <laughs> world traveler part of me was like, I hate it here. So I left, I modeled for a few years, came back to take a job at a television station. And then around, I spoke about this a little bit. I did a TEDx 
gosh, a year or two ago. And Mm. I talked about this a little bit in that more because my body just kind of started giving out on me in my late, mid, late twenties. I started to get symptoms of, you know, a lot of skin issues, joint pain, stomach issues. And then one day I woke up and I had a huge bald spot on my head. Not just like, you know, like hair thinning. I mean, it was like very evident. And of course, at this time, I'm the host of a morning show. So I had a bit of a come to Jesus moment (laughs) of Mm. what is happening in my body. And I was diagnosed with alopecia areata and a few other autoimmune illnesses. And so I really had to start taking a deep dive into what is this toxic stress doing to me? What is happening in my body? And there's so much interesting research out there, the linking trauma and autoimmune illness and knowing that I had my fair share of trauma, I started to look deeper. And of course, as every therapist Mm -hmm. kind of goes through, I call it like the gateway book into becoming a therapist. (laughs) I read The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And I was like, this is me. This is me. This is me. And so next thing you know, I had turned 30 and I was enrolling in grad school and I just decided to change everything and start over. And it's been the best decision I've ever made for myself. So, yeah. Mm, Thank you for sharing that. And you kind of are leading right into my next question, which is, you know, what led you to work with complex trauma? And I'm assuming that that had to do with your own experience. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Of course. Yeah. So NARM was just so validating for me. So It was really interesting because I was in grad school and I wasn't hearing a lot about trauma. And really, because, you know, CPTSD is not in our diagnostic manual here in the States, it just wasn't talked about. And yet I was reading books. I was reading so much information, so much rich information and other countries who you really have recognized CPTSD. And just with my own experience, you know, from what I know about my entrance into the world as an infant was it was not a welcoming one. It was a very traumatic one. And so it's kind of led me to work with other people who have early life developmental trauma. I think there were a lot of questions about whether I was wanted, whether it was a pregnancy that should have been kept. Yeah, there was just a lot of shame, a lot of secrecy around the way that I came into the world. So the message that I got was that I'm not wanted. You know, they don't want me. My biological parents don't want me. And so that that was the beginning, right? Is yeah. and I I didn't quite come to terms with this until way later in life. I always felt like I didn't belong. I always felt those who are familiar with NARM will relate with the connection survival style, which is essentially when those early connection needs are not met, you start to find other ways to find value in yourself and to find worth in yourself. And beyond the cultural differences of being a brown person with mixed cultural ethnicity and moving all over the world, um, even the way I entered the world, knowing what I know now about how much of an impact that can have on your nervous system development. NARM just really validated for me that that was a trauma. It was actually a sexual assault that got me into therapy in my 20s. Mm. So it was what we think of stereotypically kind of as like the big T traumas. And I hate calling big T and little T because I think there's some nuance there and some connotations there. Mm -hmm. But in a way it was because big T, PTSD, shock traumas are validated in the literature. That's what got me into therapy. So it was helpful for me. I saw an EMDR therapist, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing specifically for my shock trauma. And then I discovered all this other stuff around why do I feel like I don't belong? Why do I feel like I'm not important? Why do I hate myself so much? But you know, on the surface, you would never see this because every morning it was good morning, Kansas City. Welcome to the morning show. We can't wait to dive in. Mm -hmm. And so there was just such a dissonance going on internally and so much conflict. And so when I was able to kind of realize, I remember reading a book, actually, I was going through all this medical testing, they were trying to figure out what's this autoimmune illness? Why is she not feeling good? Why is her hair falling out? You know? And so I was going to the gym because I was like, okay, I can't control the diagnoses, but I can take care of myself. I need to start taking better care of myself. I need to go to the gym. I need to eat right. And, you know, but it was coming from this really like forced place of like, if you don't do this, your hair is going to keep falling out and then you're going to lose your job and then you're going to lose your livelihood and then you're going to die. So I was in this really like wonderful awful storm of like, 
ah, how do I make my life make sense? Yeah. And so one day I went to the gym and I listened to this book. I wish I could remember what it was. I think it might've been a Sue Johnson, like maybe hold me tight or it was something to do with attachment. You know, by now I was like, well, versed. Mm-hmm. I was a detective. I was, you know, yeah. I'm going to find out what's wrong with me, you know, and mm-hmm. WebMD was only taking me so far. So I was reading this book and I was listening to it on Audible. I was walking into the gym and getting ready to work out. And the author said, she gave this story. She was like, imagine going to a hospital birthing unit and imagine, you know, the room where they have all the babies and there's all these babies in a row and they're all swaddled and they're all cute and adorable and comfy. And imagine, you know, looking at one of those and going up to one and pointing at them and saying that one. That one is not valuable. That one is not important. That one is not special or precious. And I just started sobbing. (laughs) I just was like, oh "Oh my God. And I didn't realize that that is how I viewed myself. And that was 25, 26, 27 that I was starting to realize this at 27, you know, somewhere around there, years of age. And I was like, wow, I had thought my whole life that I wasn't important. And then everything made sense everything. I was like, oh, this is why I'm choosing toxic environments. This is why I'm choosing toxic relationships. This is why when somebody, a partner who's supposed to love me tells me I suck and I'm never going to amount to anything, my brain goes, oh yeah, that checks out. I do suck. Mm. Rather than, wow, that's really cruel. I could maybe find a better partner. But it was that. And you know, I'm sobbing in the middle of the gym. So I ran to the locker room and just had to kind of regulate and really look at what just happened. Why did I have such an emotional reaction to that? And it took years. I mean, it was years later before I found NARM. And that's when I understood this is a deep rooted sense of just not having any worth. It was more than just, oh, you're repeating some patterns because you're stupid. You know, it was nothing to do with that and everything to do with the messages I had received about myself, the environmental failures that were involved in the way that I came into the world and moved through the world. And it's still a work in progress, but I continue to find new layers and new nuance around, okay, wow, that was a message I internalized. That makes sense. And I think that's the best thing I've gotten from NARM is that your symptoms always make sense in the context Mm -hmm. of which they formed. They always make sense. And you may not know exactly why, you know, I was able to learn about my birth story later, but sometimes we never do. And so now I work sometimes with adoptees. I work with what I call NPE cases, not parent expected cases where, you know, the parents who have raised you end up not being your biological parents. And people are discovering this more and more because of these DNA tests available. It's challenging to not understand your lineage and to not know where you came from and to not know why you feel so unimportant. And then sometimes if you can find out the story, great, it's validating. But even if you never know the story, I think NARM has provided me with a framework to help me understand this came from somewhere. This wasn't something you just made up in your head and, oh, you're too sensitive. You know, it was because that's what I always thought it was. Oh, I'm just so sensitive. I'm right. just not made for this world. Right. Something's wrong. And that that sensitivity, like that's pathologized almost. It's just one more layer of one more thing that's wrong with us when we're sensitive, right? Yes. Can I just highlight, there's a couple of things you said that just jump out at me and that I feel are so, I would love for you to drive it home a little bit more, but you talked about how high functioning, like in the work that you were doing, like super high functioning, getting up every morning, kind of having this smile on your face. And And how validating that can be for so many who are really high functioning Mm -hmm. and like that sense of like crumbling internally, Yeah, that there can be both. And often there is. Oh, yes. I think usually, you know, I think most often (laughs) because the message we get is if you're not hustling, then, you know, you're doing something wrong or you're not going to be successful. And that was also part of, so in NARM, they're called these, you know, these shame-based identifications and these pride-based identifications. Mm -hmm. So the shame-based identification for me, my shame was telling me you're not important, you don't belong. So you need to work, 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 be more, do more so that if people don't want you, at least they'll need you. Mm. And then the pride-based identification was, I'm awesome. I'm a perfectionist. I'm I'm an achiever. Because people would go, how do you do it all? You know, how do you like go to work and do this and do that? I'm like, oh, you know, I just don't sleep. And uh, well, I barely eat and, you know, and you can do it too. (laughs) And then I would just, it was like, oh my God, it was like a robot. But I had learned messages around A, my value and B, being objectified. You know, I had received these messages about being objectified and how I just needed to be a machine 
And if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. So you got to work harder and you got to do more instead of what I really should have been doing was slowing down and listening to my body. And so I see the emergence of my autoimmune illnesses as sort of the big signal of like, hey, you didn't, my body going, you didn't listen to me when I whispered. So now I'm going to scream and I'm going to make you pay attention. And what better way to do that than to make your hair fall out, right. which is linked to your appearance, which is linked to your livelihood. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to pay attention. And God, it was brutal, but it worked. Yeah. I mean, I did start paying attention and getting medical tests and diving deep into my trauma. What's happening in my body that why does it feel so unsafe all the time, so activated all the time? And then my strategy to try to regulate was to do more. You know, it was to perfect and to please. And that was also glorified, you know, hustle culture. It was also, wow, she's got it all. And meanwhile, I'm like going home (laughs) alone and sad and in horrible, horrible relationships. I'm not anymore. Thank God. Mm. I'm very pleased to announce I am about to marry a wonderful, Mm. wonderful human. Oh, congratulations. Says only nice things to me. So thank you. But I didn't believe that was possible even a few years ago. You know, I just thought, well, I mean, this is who I am. I just kind of (laughs) suck. And I really thought that on some level. Yeah. Wow. Something else you said that just really rang true is this idea of like, well, I too kind of struggle with the big T, little T yeah. because there's part of me that feels like the little T's are bigger sometimes. Like, yes, that's right. Like that's what's underneath. Yes. It sounds like what you said, the kind of the big T trauma is validated mm-hmm. in society, but it's like once you sort of address that, the more simple situation, then we realize there's like this iceberg underneath mm-hmm. of all of the things. And so I'm really hearing you speak to that, that the big T's, they can bring us to recognize yeah. what's underneath and perhaps even more profound. That's so true. Yeah, it's so true. I see that a lot in my practice now. People come in for something like that is clearly valid, you know, sexual assault. I work with sexual trauma quite a bit. Sure. And so they come in to treat that. And it was the same thing I did, you know. And then as we start to realize, okay, were there things that maybe exposed you to certain environments or certain situations where these traumas are, it's like a vicious cycle, right? So you have trauma, you believe something about, let's say, love. Let's say, you know, you have an abusive background and where where you were abused and you learn the hand that feeds you is also the hand that abuses you. And so you learn that that's what love is. It's no surprise to me that that's also going to predispose you later for more trauma because what happens that it's not surprising when there is a relationship where there is that intimate partner violence happening because, well, we've learned that this is what love is and this is okay. So, and it causes so much confusion and so much shame. And so I enjoy working with people. I mean, I enjoy it, (laughs) but it is gratifying to work with people as they're getting out of that fog Mm. after surviving so much and starting to realize, oh, this is a real thing. And it's not that there's something wrong with me. It's that something in my background possibly contributed to the way that I feel and the way that I was put at risk, the way that I was, you know, predisposed to more trauma. And so sometimes I see that happening and I do wish we had more of a conversation around the quote unquote little T traumas Mm -hmm. because they cause so much dysregulation and so much disorganization. And just like, you know, part of my story, like it's easy to see where someone who believes they're not worth anything would expose themselves to people who reinforce that message. Right. And that's hard. It's a hard thing to unlearn and to have hope about when you're in it. In the thick of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just so appreciative of number one, you're opening up with your personal story and the way and having such an open heart and sharing that with all of us because there's so much to learn there when we kind of like can zoom out Mm. and then when we can zoom in and like see the individual experience, how important that is. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for validating that. It's it's a little weird to be this vulnerable, but I think it's also you know, we love vulnerability here. I know. I do too. (laughs) On the podcast. Okay. So you have this, you know, background, you move into the world of therapy. And I'm curious, at what point did you find NARM? Was it Mm. while you were in grad school or what, you know, what led you to being trained in NARM? Yeah. So my initial sort of leap into going back to grad school was, you know, I had just turned 30. I was still working full time. I was still um, hosting the morning show and it was a blur of a few years, but a friend of mine told me about NARM and just that it was this incredible new cutting edge modality and to check it out. So 
when I read the description, it kind of was, it was like all of my favorite trauma researchers getting together and having a baby. It was like (laughs) neuroscience, attachment, you know, mood. I mean, it's the neuroaffective relational model. Mm -hmm. So, and then when I read about, okay, CPTSD, okay, sold, because I had started to just read about complex trauma on my own and it started to make more sense. Oh, that's why I do that. You know, because even as I was starting to move towards greater safety and greater regulation and healthier relationships and healthier environments, my system was still freaking out because my nervous system was going, hold on, well, when's the other shoe going to drop? Right. And that's such a hallmark of complex trauma is that as we move towards greater safety and joy, we also become sometimes more dysregulated right. because we don't trust it. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is... And I tell my partner this sometimes, you know, like, all right, when's he going to change? When's the flip going to switch? When's he going to be mean to me? When is he going to, you know, and it's been a challenge. I'm still learning how to settle into this, but it was just confusing. And there wasn't a lot of literature helping to explain why. So some exposure to somatic experiencing helped me to understand, okay, why my body, why my system was freaking out a little bit. EMDR was helpful, but I think NARM was the missing piece for me where the developmental aspect and the relational aspect really got introduced. So yeah, my friend telling me about it and me, I really just jumped two feet in while I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. So I decided, maybe this is where those achiever parts come in handy. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit. I really didn't know a ton. I just was like, I'm doing it. I was really nervous about starting my own practice. And I just, I wanted a specialty and it was resonating so well with me. That when the training came up in Austin, it was in my, I think it might have even been my first year of grad school. I just jumped in and it was cool because I think NARM has really informed now how I view my clients as just primarily humans first. Because grad school was kind of teaching me, not that it was teaching me something different. I'm really, really grateful for my education because I actually chose a clinical social work route which social work has a much more systemic approach. So when we're talking about environmental failures, you know, we're talking about how has your systems, how have your systems failed you? So not only, sure, parents are a part of it, of course, you know, but also your family system, your school system, your community, your church, the culture as a whole, all of these things influence us and condition us in certain ways. And so the one cool thing about my graduate school experience was that the social work lens is very strengths-based, which I appreciate. We really look at people as powerful and valuable inherently, and it has a systemic approach as well. So we're not just looking at what's wrong with this person, you know, like, what's mm-hmm. wrong with you? Your, your chemicals in your brain are messed up. So I was getting a little bit of that, but as far as like diagnosing, it was just learning how to use the diagnostic manual. The DSM was so, so pathologizing. And I realized why we have it and why we need it. And, you know, Right. Labels can be helpful and categories and all of that. Sure. But on the one hand, I was learning like, here's the cluster of symptoms to meet. This is what major depressive disorder looks like. And there wasn't a lot of mention of trauma. So it just was kind of like, yeah, these are people who are messed up, who have mental illness. Not these people are in pain because they are responding appropriately to traumatic experiences. Right. There's no, there's no disorder. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That really informed how I started my practice because, and I was grateful for both and to see, to understand how this was going to be clinically diagnosed in the medical field, but then to also see how the trauma informed lens really broadened that and added a lot more nuance. And so I don't see the need for just willy nilly diagnosing people because most of the time there's some kind of trauma there that we need to work through. So it was interesting. I just did it through grad school and I kind of got to see both sides and they complemented each other in some ways. They contradicted each other in some ways, but it was important for me to see that there was another option and that I could do therapy in the way that I wanted to, in the way that I needed before. So it was enlightening and I think it was just hopeful for me. And I'll say this, I think there's a lot of modalities that are very helpful. But for me personally, some of the evidence based ones that like most therapists learn in school, like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of those didn't work for me, they just didn't resonate. And I use those concepts because they are very helpful. And it's helpful to understand, oh, this is a thinking pattern. The, the missing piece was, well, where did that thinking pattern come from? Why do I have a tendency to catastrophize? 
eyes. Where's the root? Why do I have this mental filter? It's like, oh, if as soon as you access safety, your world fell apart and that was a pattern in your life, it kind of makes sense that as soon as you, you know, inch towards joy, now your system goes, well, when's the other shoe going to drop? So it was just, you know, CBT was just like, oh, you're catastrophizing. <laughs> like you're, you're finding one little thing <laughs> like, and making okay. it a big deal. And it felt invalidating because I was like, right. but it's kind of true. And this pattern exists for a reason, I swear. Mm -hmm. I needed more depth. And that was just me personally. And like I said, those modalities are helpful and useful in a lot of contexts, but I just needed more. Once I start pulling at a thread, I think I'm the type of person that I just want to go for it and I want to learn everything I can. Yeah. Well, listeners obviously can't see me, but I'm like nodding my head vigorously. <laughs> like I can't stop. I'm like, yes, all of this resonates for me. And I think for so many of us who become therapists, like, you know, we have a history that led us to doing this kind of work. You know, we've kind of had our own journey and we want to support others in their journey. You know, a lot of us have a history of complex trauma. And so learning something like CBT, you're like, okay, I, I can see the usefulness of this in some context. Like, so I appreciate you sharing that and kind of how you hold that because yeah. I know a lot of listeners will resonate with that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there that I get why it's evidence-based and I get why it does help so many people. And if you have complex trauma, sometimes it's just not quite enough to touch that. And so NARM has really expanded, I think, the options mm. for me of what I can provide. And a lot of it is just, you know, it's allowed me to be a human in my own practice, or it's given me more of that permission, I should say, mm -hmm. you know, um, whether it has or not, but yeah. I've given myself more permission to be a human by utilizing NARM and using those concepts. And I think by doing that, I'm also helping to reinforce some of the agency that my clients have, because so often we just disconnect from that. We just think, well, I'm broken. And then sometimes that gets reinforced by things telling you, well, just change, you know, change your thoughts, change your life. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Well, I didn't think about that. That sounds simple. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we go down that whole rabbit hole. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So now I'm curious if you have any in the work that you're doing or either personally, I mean, you've given us a sense of personally kind of your own journey and struggle and what's brought you to where you are. But I'm curious if you've worked with anyone, if there's any clients that you have that you can share with us you know, working with this complex trauma and kind of how you've held it, how they've held it and yeah. how that's transpired. Yeah, there have been some really cool ones. And I can tell you even just while I was finishing up my internship, I, you know, and I still deal with imposter syndrome and I still, those parts come out for sure. It was interesting because I would, <laughs> I would do the rule book, you know, just sort of A plus B equals C approach that I was taught in school. And I wasn't getting anywhere. And sometimes I would ask the same questions, but just in like a NARMI way. And I, I just say NARMI, like it's a, yeah, it's a term. It's a thing. It's a clinical term. You look <laughs> it up, you know, and I would just change the phrasing slightly and suddenly it would unlock all of this information. And I'd be like, oh, well, why didn't, you know, Yeah, I could have just asked it that way. And so that has been neat to see how if I just change the language a little bit, when I'm inviting people to get curious, instead of going, hey, here's a tool to change your thinking, <laughs> um, they open up. Right. And I have had a really cool client who just, they're one of the, the reasons I think I stay in this work, but they had a significant, significant sexual trauma, developmental trauma, all of the above, all of it. I mean generationally, it wasn't something that was spoken about. It's still not something we like to speak about, you know, right. and they, you know, had a lot of addiction, had, you know, been on really heavy drugs and started to have auditory hallucinations and lots of paranoia, lots of hypervigilance, lots of just delusions. I mean, not functioning, not functioning at all, not able to work, couldn't leave the house, couldn't drive a car. It was just so panic episodes upon panic episodes. I was given this client as an intern. <laughs> wow. Feet <laughs> right in, right? Just jumping right in. Oh, man. Yes. Imagine all the imposter parts. I was like, mm. okay. You know, and the working diagnosis was schizophrenia. And I was like, I don't know anything about this. What am I going to do? What, like, where do I even start? And so I just did what I was learning in NARM. When I was in grad school, I was like, I'm just going to try it because I knew there was a history of trauma. So I was like, that part I know about. That part I think I can work on. Yeah. We did a combination of various things. NARM was a, a big one, a really big modality used there. And it has been less than two years. I think it's been a year and a half maybe. Um, and they are working full-time 
They are living on their own with a roommate. They are paying rent. They still have some auditory hallucinations, but there's boundaries with them. So they don't interfere so much with daily functioning. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, they love themselves. They are blossoming. I like cried (laughs) when I finished my internship because I just was so proud. It still is mysterious to me. And that's the cool thing about NARM. You don't really have to know what processes happened yeah. internally for that person to help them. Yeah. But the way they speak about themselves, they left an abusive relationship. They processed all, a lot of their sexual trauma. They are now, like I said, working full time, driving, paying rent, flirting with a new relationship, a healthy relationship. They're just blowing me away with the leaps and bounds. And yeah, a lot of the symptoms, the delusions, they're gone. They're much, much lighter. They're manageable. And the auditory hallucinations was a big one because that was really driving them to feel Mm -hmm. just so disconnected. And so they can hold boundaries with those parts now. They have a much more empowered sense of themselves, just the way that they talk about themselves now. It's just so much more compassionate. Whenever I have those hard weeks where I'm like, Crystal, are you even doing anything? I think of them. In NARM, when you are kind of going through a transformation, it's like the caterpillar going into the cocoon yeah. and like jellifying, you know, you mm-hmm. deconstruct everything and it's so painful and it's weird and it's goopy and it's confusing and, you know, but you're in this cocoon and you're working through it and you're doing it, you're deconstructing everything and then you're going to slowly reconstruct everything and you're going to come out as a butterfly. And that was how I experience this was wow this person and they actually said um, I finally feel like I'm coming out of the goo wow "Ah!" and it just oh and I see it you know yeah yeah gosh I'm tearing up just thinking about that oh me too that's so beautiful it's so cool it's why I do this work it really is it's it's just so personal to me to see that people can have they're not going to have just the brain that they have now you know it's not like you're just stuck in this forever. And I think that was what a lot of the D- <laughs> I, I want to blame the DSM for everything. <laughs> it's not true. That was what my introduction to mental health was. There's something wrong with me. You know, there's something deeply wrong with me. And I think I see that in my clients where they come in and they're just horrified at who they are and what they're doing and the way they're behaving. And to be able to sit and say, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with you. You've learned some behaviors and you've internalized some messages about yourself. It's just been the coolest thing. And it's just so gratifying, obviously, as I'm sitting here crying. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. And I feel so held knowing that this sensitivity of mine, because I am a very sensitive person. This is one field where my sensitivity and my empathy is a superpower. It's not something that gets shamed. And oh my God, I cried through most of the NARM training. (laughs) Because it just raising my hands. It was so (laughs) validating. And I just, you know, and I felt so safe and so held in front of the people in the NARM training that it was cool to just get to be a human and to just get to honor that in myself and in others. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing that. And just bringing your heart. I know I said that before, but it's so impactful to hear the real like experiences. This was my opening up to just vulnerability, you know, and obviously I love Brittany Brown's work, but learning to touch into my own humanity has actually been the journey. You know, I think a lot of us spend so much of our lives trying to disown our humanity and trying to be tougher and harder and more protected. And I get it. I still do that. You know, I still have these heavy, heavy protective parts that want me to just hole up and never trust anyone ever again. And the journey for me has been, what if we can soften? You know, what if we can really invite more compassion, more curiosity, instead of less, more understanding, instead of pathologizing and judging and shaming, which is where most of us live, I think, or where many of us live. And I think it's where I Mm -hmm. lived for a long time. And it's where a lot of my clients live. And okay, we have those parts, they're protective, and they're there. And Mm -hmm. I like to think of those strategies as, you know, that judgy part of you, that shamey part of you, it's in your back pocket. You know, we're not trying to rip it away. We're not mad at it. We're not trying to banish it. We are so thankful that you had those judgy parts to help you survive the situations 
that you were in that were threatening to you and your well-being. That's right. And they're in your back pocket. So it's okay. They're going to be there. They're your little security blanket. Yeah. We don't need to get rid of it. And I think that sometimes people fear that if they get better, they will lose these edges, you know, like, especially artists. I hear this a lot with artists. Oh, but if I'm mm. not down and if I'm not, I won't be able to access this creativity. Mm. And it's actually the total opposite. The way that I see it is it actually gives you more agency and more intentionality around how you want to use those edges, how you want to use those strategies, but they're still there. Wow. And I think that's so helpful because then we learn, oh, I'm not getting rid of parts of myself. I'm embracing them and I'm utilizing them. And I am actually just having more choice mm -hmm. around when I engage in these parts rather than these parts controlling me mm -hmm. and making me, you know, feel something or do something. And so I try to see these, you know, what we call survival strategies in NARM, those perfectionist patterns, those performance patterns, those addictions, those whatever, people pleasing patterns, like those are still useful tools. You still get to have them. We are not trying to disown them. What we do want to do is just wonder, are there other options? And can I use this here and maybe not use it here? And we're just increasing that agency, which I think that's really the crux of NARM, right? As we're looking for little right. cracks in your experience, where do you have agency? You know, we feel like things are happening to us so often because sometimes they really are, you know, rather than happening yeah. for us. And in NARM, the invitation is really, where do you have some agency and how can we cultivate more of that? And it usually starts with, honestly, with curiosity, you know? And so in NARM, a lot of times what I'm doing is just holding space to have curiosity and to ask the questions about where might this strategy have been useful? How has this been helpful? Mm -hmm. What's right about this strategy that you hate so much? And then we can, we can shift the conversation to, oh, okay, well, well, maybe those perfectionist parts help me get through school. You know, or maybe they helped me maintain a relationship mm -hmm. with my parents, you know, and I needed that for my survival. And so can we hold those parts and provide them with what they need so that they don't run the show, but so that you still have them. They're just, they're just quieter. <laughs> they're less dominating. Yeah. Oh, Crystal, this has been just so great to hear you and your experience and how you're holding all of these principles and how they're working for you in your practice. I really have enjoyed this conversation. I wondered if you could share with us how listeners might get in touch with you and the work that you're doing. Do you have a website? Tell us all the things. I do. Yeah. So I'm experimenting with a little bit of writing. I'm doing a little more speaking and writing these days on my Instagram. So I try to be pretty active on there. My handle is C-R-Y-S-T-L-E-L-A-M-P-I-T-T. -T. So it's just Crystal Lampet, but Crystal is spelled a little funny. So I okay. like to tell people. And then my website is clwellnesskc.com. So I have a list of books that you might be interested in, you know, different ways you can work with me. I have all that stuff on my website as well. So yeah, please feel free to, you know, shoot me a message, ask me any questions. And yeah, I'd love to stay connected. Wonderful. And we'll put those links in the show notes as well for those who are looking for that. Well, Crystal, thank you again. My heart is so open to you and what you've shared. And I... I can't wait for the community to hear this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. And thank you for making this a safe space for me. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Hey, transforming trauma listeners. Please join us starting in September for our online NARM basics training to learn how to transform trauma. This training is available for helping professionals working with clients or populations dealing with complex trauma. Now more than ever before, it is essential that we learn how to resolve complex trauma and support post-traumatic growth. If you are looking for more advanced training in understanding the impacts of attachment, relational, developmental, and intergenerational trauma, and are working in healthcare, education, substance abuse recovery, or allied fields, join us for this level one NARM training to become a NARM informed professional. For more information and to apply, please visit narmtraining.com forward slash online basics. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. 
We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma.